Well, I think in this country, people do tend to look to, to poets. I mean, the poets in this country have always been the smart ones. People would say, what are you going to do when you leave school, Sam? I'd say, I'm going to be a poet. Well, I remember there was an article in The Listener which said something about me being the John Travolta of New Zealand poetry, which I am. I've been performing since I was born, <laughs> um, about 33 years. As far as doing the poems, I did my first public reading when I was about 17 at, the, at Murray's Bay up on the North Shore. I remember I, I drank a bottle of beer and was uh, violently sick, I was so nervous. People uh, uh, have this strange idea that poetry is, as in the words of one of my other poems, which I may read later this evening, that um, people who think that poetry is about love and that life should rhyme, neither of those things are true, of course. I get very tense, get very nervous. It's, it's here, it's on the line. I've got people here who have come because they're friends of mine who have never been to a poetry reading in their lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, for them, I want to go out. And because of them, I'm nervous. Mm -hmm. I'm a nervous young girl. But I'm ready to go! Oh, yeah! <laughs>
uh, song, a lot of the poems I tell you actually have been set to music, but uh, I'm not here with my band. I've got a new band called Velvet Vice going at the moment, up in Auckland. Uh, Auckland, where the hell do I live? Uh, Wellington, I think is the, the, uh, the last checking in stage. Um, and Velvet Vice, quite a new group. Uh, Sam Hunt and his Velvet Vice. The actual, our, our main song is going to be uh, one I've just written called, called, in fact, Velvet Vice. It's got a little refrain line, which you may as well put to memory. Uh, you make me rise like fire, you make me glide, you make me slide like ice every time you take me inside your velvet vice. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's, it's <laughs> great. Uh -huh. Auckland had come through my childhood and early adolescence to represent some of the death, in a way, in the suburbs. Um, I felt I had to escape, get out of that sort of place. I found myself drifting back to Nelson for many reasons, but it was, I think, in the end, almost a place where I could feel a man was allowed to be a poet and still be a man. This was the estuary country, this was the inlets of the heart. Uh, one of my reasons and love for estuaries, I suppose, came, in fact, I don't suppose, I, I say definitely came from my love for, as a young poet, particularly for Dylan Thomas. And uh, in a way, this became my land. One, one of the relations with whom I used to stay when, when I was um, down here as a child was an aunt, Hilary. She lived up in the Pangatotra Valley. She died when I was about tw 10 or 11, um, and uh, she was, among other relations, you know, very strong in the encouraging of the writing of poems. When she died, I felt in, a, in a one way that I'd lost a poetic mother. She had strange dreams, the whole of that last year. One about me. I have her letters still telling of how I'd one day walk out on stage. Who would have believed it? Hillary did, and not long after died. I went by the farm today, but didn't go in. Her husband lives there still, a prosperous farmer who dabbles in the arts, happily remarried. I could only watch the river flow past the farm, the Tasman mountains heave through mist, the poplars hold the light apart. And I thought for a moment, I saw Hillary wave from the farmhouse door. The rain quickened, soon everything, the river flat farm, the mountains, the river and poplars, was blurred. It was years since I'd cried. Thank you very much. All of the poems and all of the books will not explain this. Your husband, mates, your family and friends laid into you with their idea of a life, kicking the last breath out of you. I have a nightmare like this. Spiders gathering, swinging on nets, gnawing away until sunrise. Well, Carol's a poem about a lady who's uh, really probably not going to make it. I mean, it's a... Most of my poems are about things and people who are having a bit of a hard time with. And uh, Carol is probably just yet another one of those people who's, thanks to family and friends and other helpful people, is not going to be the sort of lady that she could be. So, I mean, what I write is only important if it comes across. And while I, for example, fool around a lot, and people see me falling around a lot. What I'm writing about is very serious things, by and large. Uh, you know, life is a bit of a struggle for all of us, and generally poems are written about things that happen to people in the course of their lives. There's some pretty heavy things amongst it. But that's uh, what it's all about, you know, and I like to write poems about real things that are happening to people in the hope that other people will see that, OK, this is all part of it. And so what? We're all going to survive anyway. We've still got this beautiful coastline to walk along. We're still going to have a good time. We're going to do the best we can. And that's what I admire about people, is that most of them do the best they can.
The other night I went to a fireman's ball. When I was all but broken, I hadn't slept for three days. And the men were looking for a good time. Their wives were at home. And the women were nurses from the local hospital. When does the fun start? Someone asked. And the firemen set about lighting fires under chairs, breaking down doors, pushing people around with their big hats. The women, some of them, were carried screaming down the stairs and some went willingly. I was almost in a trance by this time when someone blew the siren. Just when things were getting really exciting, when the firemen were getting dreamy and courageous, someone blew the whistle. These weren't firemen at all. They went home one by one, picking up their hats and sliding down the pole, disappearing in the smoke to their wives and children and their dreams of a ride on the big red engine. Um, <laughs> it's called When Morning Comes, or some type of flat, fat blues. Grab you, what's it laughter for? This is a soft <laughs> Grab you for a yawning kiss, feel your tongue when morning comes, it only is the old mattress. Climbing, babe, climbing to your flat, when morning comes, I greet you, babe, greet you with a big good morning fat. Yeah, yeah, come on, Kevin, into it. There beside you, little girl, lost in wheat, fields of light, when morning comes inside you, sweet. My honey, baby, let me be your little boy. A whole night long, let me be your daddy too. When morning comes into my room, without a knock and goes again without a bang, I'm left alone, I'm left a drunk old baritone, singing like a flat saxophone. When morning comes without you, sweet. <laughs> Take yourself right home. See you in the second half. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, that's because I've been having lessons in tap dance. Don't think I'm worried about what we're going to do in the second half. <laughs> shot our load, is it? <laughs> Speak for yourself. Sure, well, I mean, I have. You know. I'll sing some boys on the game hands. <laughs> A good poem at this point to follow up in a more general uh, sense is a poem in this book here called Letter to Sam. In a bar overlooking the harbour, I've listened already to young accountants discussing the women getting into their pants as if it were an everyday occurrence, which I doubt somehow that it is. These lounge bar drinkers feel the sadness of which we speak, but fear won't let them contemplate the beauty of human weakness. Everyone a Teuton, Wagnerian overdrive. The harbour below speaks with a clatter of pleasure boats. Wives set brightly coloured pills by bedside cabinets. Lions roam the street by night, ignored. Ignored, that is, but for the distillate and bitter residue of rage, cancer. Cancer is what it breeds. Now all these things I talk about, you know, by heart. The rain still runs down to the windowsill. I wish you were here for a jug, a laugh, a game of pool. But watching you driving north this morning with minstrel at your side, I thought of a line I've been holding for more than a year. Two shaggy dogs with a bottle of beer between them. <laughs> so it is, dear Sam, so I hope it will always be. The light lifts off for a final hour. Cheers, another good day tomorrow.
certainly in New Zealand here, that the acceptance of a poet who's prepared to get out and take his poems to the people, and I don't mean to the literary uh, elite, but to people and in jails and in trade union halls and so on, uh, New Zealanders seem to respect that. Really? Catch up with you later, mate. <laughs> in a minute. Thanks, Anna. Sure, he meant you too. Oh, no, look one of those. I'm a big sausage roll man myself. Oh, look at the nice thing the and maybe, maybe a tomato sandwich with a couple of tomato sandwiches. I think you're ready to start, ready Oh, I love the nightlife. It's seven minutes past eleven. New Zealand poet Sam Hunt and Gary McCormack. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, John. Good morning, Nelson. Good morning. Sam Hunt, why have you got your sunglasses upside down? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been the position I slipped last night, John. <laughs> there we are, much better, of course. Sam, if I, if I could uh, have first uh, go with you, I, I believe that you decided to get into the professional um, poem line when you were about 14. What prompted this position and this well, decision? Well, I, I, I sort of started off to become, a, to become an accountant, didn't find myself very good at figures and so poetry, poetry was the obvious choice. I knew if I'd become an accountant I'd end up as Prime Minister. I'd probably end up as Prime Minister anyway, so I know uh, poetry was always for me the way of saying things, the way of getting things across, the way of making some verbal sense out of this chaos we call life. And when I write a poem like Beware the Man, who tries to fit you out in his idea of a hat, dictating the colour and the shape of it, he takes your head, carefully measures it, says, of course, blacks out. He sees himself in the big black hat. So you may be a member of the act he makes for you your special coloured hat. Beware, he's fitting you for more than that. Time That's is 11.21. Is it? You better get one more plug in for your show tonight. Right. Gary. Well, indeed, we've had some good turnouts for all the readings so far and we've had full houses to date. And we hope that tonight in the Fountain Court Lounge of the Post Office Hotel in Mochueca, in Mochueca that we're going to have the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Every performer worth his salt gets nervous. So, you know, I, I, I'm going to I'm gonna psych myself up. I need, I need the space. I need space. I, I can't ever stand being crowded by people when I'm ready to do a concert. Because I take the performance seriously, I enjoy it. But if I, I take it seriously because I want other people to enjoy it too. I get out on my own for a start, I go somewhere on my own. If I'm in a bar or something, I go try and find a quiet corner of the bar or else I leave the bar and go somewhere else. Have a quiet drink, go over the poems, get the rhythm in my head. And then when we're ready to go, then we go, bang. Dylan Thomas said, one, I used to think once I became a man of letters of only for 10 minutes, I was done for, but I feel okay. <laughs> that joke went over musty heads, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 